So I welcome you to the, to the last session of today. We still have three papers and uh, the topic is bank lending. And I'm very happy to give the floor to our first speaker first. That's Dominik Cucic from Denmark's Nationalbank. And his paper is about distortive effects of deposit insurance, administrative evidence from deposit and loan accounts. And it will be followed by a presentation by Florian Heider. Okay. Thank you very much to the organizers for having our paper on the program. Uh, this is joint work with Raj and Jose Luis, who are at Imperial, uh, Soterios at the University of Essex, and Stefano Pica at the Italian Central Bank. And since I'm in the research department of the Danish Central Bank, the, the usual disclaimer applies. Now, in terms of motivation, many of you are probably aware of the fact that bank runs have been at the center stage of financial crisis all throughout history. And we've seen this fact uh, both in high income as well as in emerging um, countries. And of course, we have seen plenty of evidence in the last 20 years uh, of, of this uh, importance of bank runs. So most notably in the 2008 global financial crisis, but also in the banking turmoil of March 2023, where um, bank runs have triggered ultimately the second and third largest bank failures in FDIC history. Now, these events have reignited debates over the optimal design of deposit insurance schemes, um, both among regulators and among academics. And an important contribution of this debate has been this recent paper by Debula and Goldstein, who derive a theoretical framework that shows that choosing the optimal degree of deposit insurance involves a trade-off between benefits and costs of these deposit guarantees. And we want to contribute and provide some empirical evidence to, uh, to this trade-off. Moreover, we want to uh, address what we believe is a fundamental question in this debate about deposit insurance. And that is, who are the banks that be benefit the most from these deposit guarantees? And what are the implications? And to help motivate this question, it uh, is useful to go back to uh, the banking theory, where we know that uh, bank runs can occur in different scenarios. So going back to the uh, fundamental work by Diamond and Libig, they've shown that bank runs within the set of um, solvent but illiquid banks can be driven purely by sunspots or coordination failures among depositors, meaning that uh, runs in those cases are completely unrelated to bank fundamentals, in which case we argue it's efficient to save um, these banks. However, there's another strand of the literature that shows that bank runs can indeed be driven by weaker fundamentals of banks, either within the set of panic runs or within pure fundamental runs. And in those scenarios, deposit insurance explicitly supports the weakest banks in the economy, and that may have distortive effects. Um, and we want to contribute to these debates with some empirical evidence. Now, that leads me to the question that we try to answer in our paper. So what we're going to study is whether changes to deposit insurance limits affected allocation of deposits across banks, and in turn, the allocation of credit to non-financial firms in the economy. And we're going to uh, address these questions both within and across banks and individuals and firms. We're going to tackle the question in the context of Denmark, and that is for two reasons. First, Denmark offers amazing administrative data that is crucial to answer these uh, questions. Most importantly, we have access to what we call a deposit register. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, credit registers like Anna Credit, we have something very similar on the deposit side. And I'll be more specific about that. And importantly, we can match this deposit register to a credit register, as well as detailed uh, information about firms, banks, and individual depositors. The second reason why Denmark is a great laboratory for uh, our research question is the fact that Denmark underwent two major changes to the deposit insurance uh, limits. So first, in 2008, in October, in response to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the Danish government decided to lift the previous existing deposit insurance limit. So prior to the financial crisis, deposit insurance was limited to 300,000 Danish krona, or roughly 40,000 euros. Then in October, the government decided to lift this limit, which resulted in an unlimited deposit insurance scheme, meaning that all deposits in banks were uh, guaranteed by the government. Two years later, the European Union harmonized deposit insurance across member states, and the Danish government decided to follow this uh, directive. And it adopted a new deposit insurance limit of 750,000 Danish krona, which is roughly 100,000 euros. Uh, so the second reform saw Denmark going from a period of unlimited insurance back to limited insurance. Uh, 
and we're going to study both of these reforms in our field. If you think back to the motivation on the previous slide, we want to understand whether somewhat weaker banks disproportionately benefit from these deposit guarantees. And here we're going to look at banks that are more uh, exposed to the adverse consequences of the global financial crisis. And we're going to uh, measure this exposure by looking at banks' loan-to-deposit ratio at the end of 2007. So think of this measure basically as a proxy for banks' reliance on wholesale market funding, um, which we know that these wholesale markets uh, froze once the global financial crisis uh, broke out, and that triggered a liquidity squeeze on these banks. Now, before we go into the details, let me show you some of our uh, core results. So before looking at the effects of these deposit guarantees, we're first going to establish that these uh, exposed banks not only had fragile funding, so this wholesale funding, but they also had weaker loan portfolios. So they were weaker on the asset side as well prior to the global financial crisis. So we're going to show you that these banks disproportionately lent to unproductive firms, meaning firms with lower TFP, and to firms in the real estate and construction sector which is a sector that in Denmark, as in many other countries, crashed significantly when the financial crisis broke out. And indeed, we're going to show you that this resulted in substantially higher loan losses, both during the financial crisis and in the following years at these more exposed banks. Then we're going to evaluate the effects of these deposit insurance reforms. And we're going to show you that these uh, reforms trigger a reallocation of deposits from stronger to weaker banks in the economy. So first off here, we're going to look at the onset of the global financial crisis. And we're going to show you that when deposit insurance was still limited, the onset of the crisis led to substantial liquidity pressure at these more exposed banks. However, this liquidity pressure uh, reversed once deposit insurance became unlimited. So we're going to show you these effects by exploiting our granular data starting at the individual bank level. So here, think of this as we observe every single deposit account in the economy and we're going to show you that depositors tended to withdraw more money from the more exposed banks. So the banks that were suffering more uh, from the adverse effects of the global financial crisis. Importantly, once deposit insurance became unlimited, these depositors tended to move large deposits from the stronger to the weaker banks. And interestingly, we find that this effect is especially strong among more wealthier uh, individuals. So think of those as people that were uh, monitoring their banks even stronger. Moreover, uh, connecting to the events of the 2023 turmoil, we find that these effects are uh, stronger among exposed banks that had more uninsured deposits. Um, and again, these effects among those banks with more uninsured deposits reversed as deposit insurance became unlimited. Finally, the granularity of our data allows us to uh, study at the bank level what happened to deposits that were just above and just below uh, these deposit insurance limits. And here we're going to show you that the exposed banks uh, essentially lost uninsured deposits and gained insured deposits. And I'll be more specific about that uh, as we go on. We find very similar effects when we look at the 2010 reform. So this change from unlimited to limited deposit insurance again triggered a reallocation of mostly insured deposits towards the more exposed or weaker banks. A natural question once you see these results is, how is that possible? How did these banks manage to attract this inflow of deposits? And here we're going to show you some evidence that suggests that at least part of the reason is related to deposit rates, because we're going to show you that these exposed banks raised deposit rates uh, relative to the other banks in the economy, both in 2008 when deposit insurance was limited and after the 2010 reform. So essentially, these banks were raising rates differentially in order to attract this inflow of deposit funding. Finally, we go back to the lending side, and we're going to show you that firms that were more reliant on these exposed banks experienced substantially better credit availability in 2009, so when deposit insurance was unlimited, relative to 2008 when there was limited insurance. And these effects are especially strong for uh, weaker firms. And we're also going to um, show you this data at the loan level, where we essentially show you that these banks who, if you remember at the top, had weaker loan portfolios prior to the crisis, we're going to show you that they did not seem to improve their lending behavior after this inflow of deposit funding. Now let me say a few more words about the data and the institutional background and our strategy. 
So at the core of our analysis really is this um, deposit register, which is essentially um, the universe of retail deposit accounts in the Danish economy that covers every single deposit account uh, at 92 banks in Denmark between 2004 and 2015. So this data covers roughly uh, the accounts of six and a half million uh, individuals. For each deposit account, we observe the year end volume as well as the interest payment over the previous year on this account. And we can use this information to back out what has been the interest rate on this deposit account um, in that year. Importantly, each account features information on both the depositor and the bank uh, where the account is held. And we can link this uh, information to banks uh, supervisory information as well as a credit register where we observe term loans, credit lines, and so on, to roughly 100,000 non-financial firms. Um, so we see the loans that these banks make. But we can also observe more information about the depositors. So we have individual tax records um, and, uh, for example, data on their wealth and so on. Now, to reiterate the timing of these deposit insurance reforms, because this is going to be uh, key. So prior to the financial crisis, deposit insurance was limited to 300,000 Danish kroner, or uh, uh, 40,000 euros. Then in October 2008, Lehman collapsed, and the uh, Danish government wanted to prevent a panic, um, and therefore decided to lift this insurance limit. Uh, here it's important to note that Danish banks were not really directly exposed to asset-backed securities or things like that in the US, but rather they had increasingly relied on this wholesale funding in order to uh, to finance a local credit boom in the Danish economy. So that's why it, at least some of the banks were particularly hard hit by this freezing of the wholesale funding market. And then two years later, in October, the Danish government uh, adopted a new deposit insurance limit of 100,000 euros or 750,000 Danish kroner. One thing that is important to note is that in Denmark, just like in the US, deposit insurance applies at the depositor bank level, which means that if you have deposits above the insurance limit, you can simply take it out of your bank, open a new bank account in a different bank, and you remain fully insured on, on your deposits. Now, our empirical strategy is going to leverage variation across different uh, dimensions. So first, the time dimension, meaning that we're going to look at what happens before and after these uh, deposit insurance reforms. Second, we're going to leverage variation in the size of deposit accounts which allows us to look at what happens to deposits that are just above and just below these insurance limits. And that is going to help us substantially in identification. Finally, we're going to look at variation across banks where we exploit these differences in the loan to deposit ratio as a proxy for banks' um, exposure to the global financial crisis. Now, let me show you first some evidence on how did the banking sector look prior to the uh, onset of the financial crisis? So here, just close. Doesn't look like I can change the slides anymore. Yes, okay, thank you. So here we're showing you that in the period between 2004 and 2007, so prior to the financial crisis, these more exposed banks tended to differentially lend to less productive firms and firms in the real estate and construction sector. And the latter you can think of as a measure of credit risk um, uh, because the real estate sector crashed during the financial crisis. And indeed, in this plot here, we're showing you that the more exposed banks experienced substantially higher loan losses relative to other banks in the economy as soon as the global financial crisis uh, started to break out. So this is just some motivating evidence on the asset side of these uh, banks' balance sheets. Now. What happens in 2008 when the global financial crisis broke out? So here we're showing you bank level regressions of quarterly changes in total deposits, the deposit rate, and total liquidity. The interesting thing to note is that in 2008 Q3, when deposit insurance was still limited, but the global financial st crisis started to break out, these more exposed banks suffered liquidity pressure, meaning that their deposits were declining, their liquidity position overall was deteriorating, and this is even though they were increasing their deposit rates. Now, what happens when we go just one quarter ahead where the crisis is still going on, but deposit insurance is now unlimited? We see that these patterns reverse. So the liquidity pressure eased off substantially, and these banks didn't have to offer um, these differentially high deposit rates. 
Of course, we're not claiming any causality here. This is just cross-sectional regressions, but it helps to motivate the evidence that we're going to uncover now in more granular data with uh, better identification. In particular, we're going to zoom into these uh, changes in deposits at the bank level. And we're going to exploit data at the individual bank level. So we see for each person, each deposit account they have in different banks. And we're going to run regressions of the sort here, where we look at changes in deposits between a given household, a given bank, uh, in 2008. So the change between 2007 and 8, And we want to understand whether depositors withdrew more money from more exposed banks, and whether this effect was amplified among depositors who had uninsured deposits. Now, one big issue here is, of course, that it could be that depositors sort into different banks, right? It may be that more exposed banks experience greater outflows of deposits because they have different type of depositors. We're going to get around this problem by looking at uh, depositors who have deposits in at least two different banks. Uh, and we're going to introduce a household fixed effect or individual fixed effect, meaning we're absorbing any type of individual variation. And we're looking at if you have two different banks, do you withdraw more money from the more exposed bank or the less exposed bank? And indeed, we find, as you can see here in the first row, that individuals indeed withdrew more money from the more exposed bank, and that this effect was amplified among depositors who were above the insurance limit. Now, the interesting thing is when we go one year ahead to 2009, we see that this effect reverses, meaning, again, consistent with the bank level evidence, this liquidity pressure eased off as soon as deposit insurance became unlimited. Um, the reassuring thing is that all of these effects still hold up when we look at all depositors in the economy, because you may be concerned that this sample is somehow restricted uh, or is different than the overall population of depositors. But all the effects still hold up when we look at the full population. Now, further, um, we find that these effects are amplified when we look at exposed banks that had a greater share of uninsured deposits, meaning that they were uh, experiencing greater liquidity pressure, but again, this eased off in 2009 with unlimited insurance. Similarly, we find that the effects are stronger among depositors who are more wealthy, meaning that they seem to engage more in this monitoring of, of their banks uh, during the crisis. Now, in the last minutes, let me show you this uh, evidence where we look at the uh, bank deposit range um, level and we look at whether banks experience greater inflows of deposits um, above or below the insurance limit. Because one concern with the previous analysis is that, you know, it's the financial crisis, many things are happening. So it could be that these effects are driven by things other than the deposit insurance reforms. So what we do here is to zoom in on deposits that are just above and just below uh, the insurance limit. And if you look at purely the green lines, this corresponds to deposits that are just $7,000 above and below the insurance threshold. And you can see that prior to the financial crisis, there was no change in uh, deposit growth rates above or below the threshold. However, as soon as the crisis broke out, these more exposed banks were essentially losing uninsured deposits and experience an inflow of um, insured deposits. And this effect disappeared as soon as deposit insurance became unlimited in, in 2009. We find very similar effects in 2010 when we look at the other um, deposit insurance threshold. So again, no differential growth above and below the insurance limit. But once the reform is in place, um, the more exposed banks are experiencing an inflow of insured deposits, or said differently, an outflow of uninsured deposits. In terms of deposit rates, and let me be brief here, but we're going to show you that these banks, uh, the more exposed banks, are differentially raising deposit rates, both in 2008 when the crisis broke out, and then after 2010 when uh, insurance was unlimited. Um, and we argue that this is part of the mechanism that explains why these banks were attracting these inflows of uh, insured deposits. One minute left, so let me be brief on the um, lending side. So we go back to loan level evidence, and we're going to show you that the <coughs> uh, more exposed banks were essentially improving their lending or lending differentially in 2009 when deposit insurance became unlimited uh, by targeting um, less productive firms and firms that would eventually end up in default in the uh, years after the global financial crisis. And we find very similar effects 
uh, when we look at firm level evidence where we aggregate basically firms exposure to back to different banks and again we see that the credit availability of weaker firms in the economy so firms with lower productivity or more uh, credit risk um, improved substantially when deposit insurance became unlimited let me wrap up here um, so we contribute to this uh, debate about the design of deposit insurance guarantees by exploiting these two uh, reforms of deposit insurance limits in Denmark. We're showing how these interact with the global financial crisis, and we're exploiting this administrative data on a variety of, of data levels. And I think that the key message of the paper is really that these deposit insurance guarantees trigger this reallocation of deposits from stronger to weaker banks, and that this has implications for the credit supply to firms in the real economy as well. And uh, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And the discussant is Florian Heider. Please. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Uh, always a pleasure for many, many reasons. Um, and no, no, no disclaimer. Um, still have to get used to that. Um, so Dominic did a great job in, in, in summarizing, and I thought I'll, I'll do something different. So I'm, I'm not going to really talk a lot about the various results. There's loads of results in the paper. I won't be able to do them justice in the short discussion anyway. But here you see sort of the one benchmark, uh, and the result is that um, the depositors, individual depositors that uh, have balances above the insurance limit reduce that balance relatively more if that bank has a high loan to asset ratio that's that's the meat that's the meat of the first result when the crisis uh when the crisis hits um, um and the way to read this table on the left hand side um you have the change in deposits and you know that's what makes this paper amazing is the data is that they can observe my account holdings at every end of the year okay so by the way this needs to this is the requirement that means that i have to stay with that bank Okay, which is, I mean, I'm not taking all my money out, but okay, fine. Um, and so, um, first column, um, tries, um, if, you are, if, if, if the bank has high lo loans to deposit, the assumption is that this is an illiquid bank. Loads of loans, very few deposits. It's a measure of, of, of liquidity. I'm going to come back to that. Okay, so, yes, a crisis hits. I look at my bank high uh, loan deposit ratio. Um, I take my money out. Second column, particularly so. If I had more than the 300,000 Danish krone, because that wasn't insured. Okay, so I'm looking at the at, at the risk here, and um, and the combination is really what drives this. Is that that's what makes it the, the different difference and difference is that relatively more this effect is stronger at the at the um, if you combine having a high loan to asset ratio and having uninsured deposits. Okay, so that's the message of the first event. Crisis hits. Well, you know, your money's at risk, you take it out. Money's at risk if it's above the limit or if it's at a exposed bank. Um, fourth column is the same just with bank fixed effects. Then the next column just says, okay, this effect reverses in 2009. Why? Because what happened in response to the crisis, the Danish uh, authorities said, no worries, all, all deposits are insured. Okay, and that's why the red rectangle compares the difference in difference approach up to 2008 with the one that when you look at what, what do I do with my money from 2008 to 2009, well, money is insured, so I'm going to bring it back to my bank. So that's the first message. And let me just stress again, this is at the depositor level. That's what makes this paper really um, amazing because you can take care of a lot of confounds that way. So then the paper would move on to the 2010, when you reintroduce a limit, higher, but still, right? Now it's 750,000 krone. And um, the first thing, uh, I mean, the paper is still early, rough, and there were some results presented that weren't in the, in the paper. That's all fine, that's all good. Um, in the version that I had, now suddenly you move away from the depositor level analysis and you move back to the bank level analysis. And I just didn't quite understand. There may be good reasons for that, it's just I would like to know. If I don't see a good reason, I get suspicious, right? So um, suddenly, this is no longer this table, which I'm not sure if, if it was shown in the slides, 
um, is in the spirit the same, but it's not no longer at the depositor level. But then, okay, fine. How to read it is that after the reform is this reintroduction of an insurance limit. So if you're above 750,000, no longer insured. Um, and yes, again, you know, you are looking, um, you know, uh, the banks uh, where the accounts were um, now below that, that limit, so they're insured, above they would not be insured, they see an inflow okay, after the reform. Now you had 300,000 on the account, suddenly it's 750,000, you say, okay, fine, let me go up to 600,000 or whatever. Um, okay, the nerdy question, could this actually, you know, I, I don't know whether anyone makes a mistake and deposits 900,000 and I mean, the, the regression doesn't tell me whether you actually go to the limit and you know, that's why the bands analysis is there, which by the way, I find very hard to read. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I, I just couldn't figure it out. Um, and then, of course, more so again if the bank has this high loan to deposit ratio. Okay, so the same story is that there are these weaker banks or more liquid banks, and, and they benefit now when the deposit insurance um, is, is um, well, it's, 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 it's actually a weakening of deposit insurance, but it's still now suddenly below 750,000, you're still insured. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all good. I think my really question is, given that you have all this depositor of a question, you know, where does the money come from? Where does it go to? I mean, you can potentially, I guess, you know, you have the ideas of these people. I mean, you know, if I take it out from bank A, bring it to bank B, come back to bank A afterwards, or stay with bank C or whatever, right? I mean, you, you just don't use that, I think. And I think I would have loved, because you, you talk a lot about reallocation. And I didn't see any evidence on the re. Okay, so I, I, th I know nothing about Denmark, or very little, so I thought, okay, um, this is a paper of Danish babe. So if I know one thing, I think that every, country, every banking sector is slightly different, and, and that makes it really challenging sometimes. And so um, I went to um, um, a website that's from the banking association, um, uh, Finance Denmark. Um, they have uh, pretty easy data. It's all aggregate data, so no granularity here as well. Um, so the first thing you see is that, um, well, I mean, the banks have halved over the span of 20 years. So it's been probably tremendous consolidation. Um, and my and another question is, I think they have 90 banks. You have 90 banks in your sample. Um, now we are at 50 Danish banks. So you must have these foreign branches in there as well in your analysis. Maybe you don't. I don't know. I, I didn't see anything on that. I don't know whether it matters. But I think the point is that the banking sector is... Uh, in flux, because if you look at the employees, which is the black bar, they're, they're not halving, they're constant, so it must be mergers. And at the same time, the branches are disappearing. So, you know, there, there's stuff happening. And of course, you know, you have time fixed effects and it's different diff, but you know, I would like to just know more about the Danish banking sector. Is that something we can extrapolate from? Um, and my last point is that um, I had some fun with the data and um, the one point I want to drive home is this loan to deposit ratio. I mean, you've, you've heard that point before, but I thought I'll back it up with some numbers. So this is the loans and this is the deposits in Denmark. And yeah, you know, it's like, wow, you know, before they were having more loans than deposits and now they have more deposits than loans, dramatically. So the Danish banking sector seems to go undergo a fundamental shift. I mean, the business model is changing. They do something different. Um, um, you know, and so that means that this, this, this variable, the, the loan to deposit ratio, that's, that's dwindling over time. And your period is like from 2007, you know, when it's the peak, to 2015 when it's bottom. I, I just want to know what happens there, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's just, I think it's a missed opportunity to not tell us something about the banking sector. And so now I could come up a, with another measure of liquidity. And I could ask, well, what else does the loan to deposit ratio actually capture? So another measure of liquidity could be cash to deposits, LCR, kind of poor man's version of LCR. Okay. And I've plotted this on the x-axis, sorry, on the y-axis, and in the x-axis, loan to deposit ratio. And you see that, well, you know, it seems like the loan to deposits ratio is measuring some form of um, illiquidity because as you move to the right, you know, on average you go down, meaning um, the cash to deposit ratio is also going down. So yeah, okay, fine, you know, you can criticize that measure, but it seems to capture something. Wait a minute. So I could do the same with equity of assets, 
And you also see that banks with a low or with a high loans to deposit ratio, so again, you move to the right, you move down, means you have less equity to, um, to, to um, I mean, it's liabilities, but it's actually assets, it's the same, liabilities equals assets, hopefully. Um, and so, yes, it also is a measure of insolvency, right? And we're back to the usual problem, you know, what does it all mean? Is it, is it, is it illiquidity? Is it insolvency? So I think, you know, um, just trusting this one measure, um, I think it'd be nice to have some robustness there. So um, to sum up, um, great data, unique insights possible. Um, analysis seems early. Um, you know, there wasn't really sort of this, I mean, you really weren't taking the reader much by the hand. Um, of course, you know, exploit the deposit level much more because that's really your unique selling point. And I don't know, I would, I would, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, to me, the loan to deposit ratio is of course defensible, but it could be a lot of things going on. And, you know, it'd be nice if, if there would be some more robustness. Thank you. Thanks, Florian and Dominic, um, for this interesting paper and very timely paper. No? And if you think about last year's banking crisis and then the decision by the FDIC to also extend uh, deposit insurance and in, uh, in the international regulatory fora, I think the future of deposit insurance is also being debated. So, so thanks very much for that. So we can open the floor for any comments or questions. I see a couple of hands. Yeah, please. Yes, so my question is, what's the role of international deposits in this story? Do you have any evidence that international deposits are responsive to changes in the insurance limits? And maybe we take also the second one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, great. Oh, oh, sorry. No, things that I don't know. Uh, great paper and, uh, and the presentation and discussion. Um, maybe not for this paper, but um, given the fact that discussion focused on the banking sector, uh, I'm wondering whether there is any reallocation in the non-banking sector. So thinking about that Danish retail investor probably uh, tend to be kind of sophisticated. I'm wondering whether you could observe any changes uh, and flows into the non-bank financial institutions. And to the best of my knowledge, Danish Central Bank has very good data on that. I don't know to what extent granular it is. Again, can be another project, another paper, but I think probably something interesting comes up there as well. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, a question about the the exercise where you study deposit rates or the response of deposit rates. So in a very, very stylized model, I would expect that at least in partial equilibrium, deposit rates and bank risk move in the same direction, right? So when these banks suddenly were insured, you know, they might have got away with paying lower rates and you find the opposite. So I was just wondering if you have a story for that in mind at this early stage. Thank you, and maybe, maybe okay, we have more hands. Do you want to take a quick first reply and then we move to the other questions? I think we can collect one or two more. Okay, and then let's do that. Over. Um, I was wondering a little bit, given that you have shown that people more or less tactically allocate the deposits across these thresholds, have you also considered looking on uh, something from the unconventional monetary policy side in the sense that people would also be responsive to negative rates charged on the accounts and that they also then try to move their money correspondingly around. Thanks. Just give you a second. <laughs> um, did you also have a look on payout cases? Like uh, in, other, in other markets, we would have seen payout cases from the DGS systems. I uh, don't know much about the Danish system, but have there been any cases? And if yes, did you have a look on uh, the impact on uh, the allocation of uh, funds? Thanks. And one last question over here. Yes, uh, thanks. When we think about what happened last year in the US, one counter argument to increasing the, uh, the level of deposit insurance was you know, the issue of moral hazard. I wonder if there's anything you can say with your data about the episode in Denmark, whether there were implications in terms of risk taking or whatever. Thank you all for uh, lots of interesting questions. Uh, thanks a lot for the discussion. Um, let me pick out a few things in the interest of time and I'll be very happy to, to chat with you more uh, after the session. So um, picking up a few things uh, that were said in the discussion. So 
point very well taken. Uh, it's the paper is still very much a work in progress. So there's things that are on our agenda, like exploiting the individual account level data more, uh, and and have kind of a more symmetric approach uh, across the analysis of the two reforms. So that is definitely on our uh, on our agenda. Um, talking a bit about uh, reallocation of deposits and kind of where do the where does the money flow to and where does it come from. Um, so one thing uh, I can say is that we looked at um, the 2010 reform uh, and we were studying whether people were withdrawing their money from the banking system when this uh, new insurance limit came in. And it doesn't turn out to be the fact. So what we see indeed is that people leave their money within the banking sector. They simply reallocate across the existing banks, uh, which also speaks about the point of uh, non-banks. So we don't see, at least in the 2010 reform, too, man too many outflows um, out of the banking sector. Um, but we still have to check the same thing in the 2008 reform. Um, then there was the question about changes in loan to deposit ratios over time. Very good question. So we had the same uh, thought and we were curious basically whether these banks that had this high exposure uh, going into the financial crisis, whether they somehow changed their business model or funding model. And indeed, as you showed, there's a big decrease in loan to deposit ratios over time. However, at the bank level, these ratios are extremely sticky, meaning that if we compare who are, or if we look at who are the banks with high loan to deposit ratios in 2007, they tend to still be the w banks with the highest loan to deposit ratios five, six, seven years uh, later, just at a lower um, absolute value. Um, <clears throat> then the role of international deposits. Um, I don't think this is a big uh, concern in our data. So we have some flag of whether uh, the deposit account holder uh, lives abroad, but that is a very, very small share of, of deposits. So I don't think that this is a big um, issue. Um, I don't know how, how we're doing on time. Two more minutes. Okay, then I'll, I'll talk a bit more. Um, unconventional monetary policy, negative interest rates. We don't look at uh, that in our paper. Um, some of my colleagues at the Danish Central Bank have uh, exploited that in other contexts. Uh, but at least in our uh, work on the reallocation of deposits, we haven't looked at that. Then there was the question of uh, consolidation changes in the banking sector. Yeah, that's that's a very crucial uh, question. So indeed, there is big consolidation. We basically look at all the uh, 90 banks in 2007 that are um, showing up in super in the supervisory uh, data set uh, in in 2007, and we follow them over time. Um, we're working on basically looking at the effects of these consolidations and to what extent that affects reallocation of deposits. Um, but that's very much work in progress, so I, I cannot share too much of that, uh, of, of those results uh, yet. Um, then, yeah, I think the, the question of what is picked up by the loan to deposit ratio, it's a good question. We're uh, working on kind of benchmarking our baseline results to other measures of bank exposure or bank performance, like credit growth going into the financial crisis. Um, essentially, our uh, idea was to take a measure that has been used both on the policy side. Uh, so for example, the IMF has uh, looked at this loan to deposit ratios in identifying illiquid banks in the sovereign debt crisis, as well as in uh, academic papers where they have shown that these banks were indeed hit worse by the financial crisis. Um, but I'm very sympathetic to, um, to comparing that to other measures. And indeed, we find similar results with, with other measures of bank risk. I just want to point out that basically, I think the idea of, of the paper is not to say that um, these effects are necessarily driven by having a high loan to deposit ratio. Rather, we want to say this ratio is a measure that picks up weak banks along some dimensions. And these weak banks disproportionately benefit from these deposit guarantees. Um, so it's not so much about the, the measure per se. Um, and I think I'll wrap up here. And if there's more questions, I'm very happy to chat about them afterwards. Very good. Thanks very much to both of you.